I often think of a pilot-controlled airport as being like a four-way stop intersection. There's no authority figure controlling traffic, but there are a few rules. Everyone has to stop at their stop sign, and cars on the right have the right of way. In this way, we all have a good idea of what the other cars are going to do. Our only job is to follow the rules and not smack into another car. Sometimes we need to communicate with one another, giving hand signals or flashing our headlights to signal right away, but as long as everyone follows the rules, it's generally okay. Once traffic gets busy, though, this self-controlled system starts to break down, and we need an authority figure like a traffic cop or a stoplight to tell everyone what to do. The same is true at busier airports. When there's a lot of traffic at larger airports, pilot-controlled operations won't work. This is where air traffic control comes in. Air traffic controllers are highly trained professionals whose primary purpose, as outlined in their Bible, Joint Order 7110.65, is to prevent a collision of aircraft operating in the system. Apart from this primary purpose, they also serve to manage traffic flow and support government missions. There are additional services they can provide, which we'll detail in this course, on a workload permitting or safety basis. But again, the primary purpose is to ensure the safe separation of air traffic. The first air traffic controllers worked for the major airlines. As passenger air travel increased and the added volume of traffic required companies to organize arrivals and departures. Soon the government organized air traffic control and now all controllers are FAA employees with some contractors in smaller locations. The basic form of air traffic control is terminal control providing separation services based on observed or known traffic and airport conditions. This takes place in the control tower. Small regional airports like Easton and Maryland have a control tower here positioned somewhat in the center of the field. That gives controllers an unobstructed view of both the airport and the surrounding area. The tower controller is responsible for landing and departing aircraft at the airport's two runways. It issues pattern entry instructions for arriving aircraft, sequencing multiple aircraft to land in turns, and issues takeoff instructions to aircraft that are ready to depart from one of the runways. Aircraft that have completed landing or need to position themselves to take off don't talk with the tower controller, but with ground control instead. They also sit up in the tower and have a view of all active taxiways. Aircraft that wish to depart are given taxi instructions to the active runway, and aircraft that have landed and vacated a runway receive instructions to taxi to their destination on the field. The ground and tower controllers work together to accomplish these goals. They're able to do so solely through visually spotting aircraft on the ground and air, and by receiving position and intentions from aircraft via radio. For this reason, the most basic type of towered airport, Class D like Easton here, only requires aircraft to be in two-way radio communication. There's no need for aircraft to be identified via radar, so equipment like a transponder is not a requirement. This changes at airports that have more traffic congestion. This is Atlantic City International. It's a Charlie airport. It's also towered, and the tower generally has responsibility for the area in the inner circle, the surface area of the Charlie. Within this area, ground and tower controllers operate much the same as they do at Class D Easton. However, Atlantic City is busier, with more departing and arriving aircraft. The tower can't handle all this volume itself. Another layer of control is used at a facility called Terminal Radar Approach Control, or TRACON. The approach and departure controllers don't generally have responsibility of the immediate area around the airport, but help sequence aircraft further out. They also don't sit in the air traffic control tower, but are in windowless facilities that may not even be located at the primary airport. For this reason, they can't rely on visually spotting aircraft to control them. They need to identify them on radar. Radar can detect aircraft position, track, speed, and altitude to some extent, but does not give any additional information about the flight. Aircraft equipped with a transponder can be assigned a code called a squawk by the approach controllers. This code will be associated with information about the flight, such as aircraft type, call sign, and intentions. This information is populated onto strips that are passed from one controller to another to maintain continuity. Transponders can also have an altitude reporting capability called a mode C function, which broadcasts out altitude to the control facilities, in addition to the squawk code. Because of this, in order to enter Class C airspace, aircraft have to be equipped with these mode C transponders. Now, in addition to transponders, aircraft also must have ADSB out equipment on board, which uses GPS information to transmit position information to the ground. Approach controllers monitor aircraft on scopes like this one. 
Upon first contact with an aircraft, the controller must confirm that the aircraft they're looking at is in fact you. This is called radar identification. It can be done in several ways. One of these ways is position correlation. An aircraft can report their location in relation to a fix like a VOR or airport or a visual reporting point. For example, saying that they're 20 miles west of the Atlantic City VOR. Because controllers work in three dimensions and not two, altitude information is needed as well. So the aircraft will report its current altitude. If the controller can correlate this reported position to the observed one on the screen, they can radar identify this aircraft. Another way to identify an aircraft is to assign it a discrete squawk code and then instruct the aircraft to push the ident button on the transponder. This causes the radar target to blossom on the scope. I like to think of this as if you're trying to find your friend in a large stadium. You're on the phone and say that you think you see him a few sections over, but ask him to wave to make sure you're actually seeing him. This is like what hitting ident does for the controller. It confirms what he's looking at is actually you. Approach facilities are used for both Charlie and Bravo airports. Every aircraft operating inside them must be in radio communication. For Bravo airspace, there's the added requirement that an actual clearance is necessary to enter. The last type of facility is called an Air Route Traffic Control Center, or CENTER for short. Their role is to maintain communication with aircraft in the en route phase of their flight. In other words, they're not being handled in the departure or arrival or landing and takeoff phases of flight, which are handled by approach and tower. The majority of aircraft handled by centers are IFR aircraft at high altitudes, but VFR aircraft like us might talk to centers if we're receiving radar services called flight following, as we'll detail later in the course. The Air Traffic Controller's Bible is called Joint Order 7110.65 and can be found online via the link above. It's not typically shown in flight training, but is a wealth of information on what controllers are doing behind the scenes as we talk with them. In the remainder of this course, we'll be demonstrating how to effectively communicate with air traffic control in all phases of flight.